Welcome back to another episode of the Miracle Marketing Podcast, where we bring you interviews from business owners, celebrity guests, and hot topics. I am your host, Brandon Adams, along with my co-host, super producer, Big Perion. How's it going out there today, Big Perion? It's going pretty good, bro. Can't yeah, see. You can't see me? No, no, no. All I see is the logo. Hold on. Let's see what's going on. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm back. All right. So uh, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to be a guest on the show, send us an email to a miracle podcast on today's show. We have a special guest. Our guest is the host of Fox five sports news in Las Vegas. Mr. Mike Davis, Mr. Mike Davis, welcome to the miracle marketing podcast. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, thanks for having me. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I just wish, you know, big Perry on over there. He's got, Right next to his his right ear, he's got that picture of uh, Lionel Richie when he was wearing that that great sweater after he left the Commodores on the the album cover. So mm-hmm. if I was wearing that sweater, I feel like I'd even be doing a little better. But I am representing Miles, so I got I got Miles on my there shirt. There we go. So I got I got that. But I, yes, I don't sir. know. You, you think I could pull off the Lionel Richie sweater? That's kind of yeah. tough. Yeah, you could pull it off. You could pull it off. You it's right there. About- you see, it's right there. It's got. It's like an aqua or like a turquoise. Yeah, 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 yeah. You you cool enough for that? <laughs> okay, good. So, Mike, we coming off of uh, Super Bowl weekend here in Las Vegas, and it is NBA All Star weekend. We touch on a little bit of everything on the America Marketing Podcast, but today we're going to talk sports and we're going to talk journalism. So, before we get into sports, I want to talk a little bit about your background. How did you get started? in what you do. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of those classic stories. I, I kind of uh, grew up playing all different sports. I grew up in the Philadelphia area and I'm born in 92. So when you're, you know, a youngster born in 92, growing up in the Philadelphia area, I mean, Allen Iverson, AI was, was everything, you know? So I grew up playing all different sports. My dad was a professional tennis player. So I was really good at tennis. I was playing basketball. I was playing all different sports, but for a long time, I really had that, you know, naive dream that most young kids have that, you know, I want to play in the league, I want to do this. But, you know, you start uh, understanding, I think a lot of times, um, you know, you get older and you start looking within, you know, and I think faith and God and all that kind of stuff helps you understand like, okay, I want to be AI, but really what, what are my gifts? What are the things that I can bring to the world that are authentic to me? And, I was lucky enough um, in fourth grade to really decide I wanted to become a talk show host. And I actually recognized that moment as a young kid. So quickly I shifted from wanting to be Donovan McNabb or Allen Iverson or Roger Federer. And I ended up wanting to be like David Letterman. So I kind of had this talk show kind of thing and um, vision and this dream. And I started piecing together ways that I can make that happen for myself. So I was always like the funniest kid in the class and had kind of like a snarky, weird personality. And uh, I started doing stand up, and very quickly I was pretty good at it. I, I used to open for guys like Sherman Helmsley, uh, George what? Jefferson, you know? Yeah. So I was like in high school and I would open uh and uh, all these little rooms and my my parents actually because when you're starting off you got to do like open bikes right so I'd write all these jokes my parents would take me to these clubs and it was like a two drink minimum and you had to be 21 to get in so they'd put like a little armband on my wrist saying I'm under 21 but I'm here with parental supervision and um I kind of had like an interesting act I um did a lot of like David Brennerish, John Stewart kind of political quirky kind of stuff and uh talked a lot about my life and I was pretty good I I wasn't amazing but it was an an exercise in trying to find my voice and just get some reps learning how to entertain and I did that for a long time got good enough won some festivals and I ended up opening for guys like Sherman and stuff so it it was a cool experience and um by the time I got to college I just really kept investing in in that time and stage time. And I was the sports editor of my newspaper in high school. So I was a journalist. And then when I went to college, I was a sports editor, a uh, sports writer at the uh, newspaper in University of Miami. So I kept building these skills. And uh, quickly, 
I left school, went to work for Howard Stern in New York and got a lot of background there working with him, learning about how to interview. And I was an intern there. Then I went to work for the NFL Network. And then I went to grad school at Northwestern and uh, went to journalism school, uh, journalism school at Medill and kind of like got a little bit more of a uh, entryway into like traditional sports media. And quickly I was, you know, freelance reporting for Comcast Sportsnet. And then all of a sudden I got my first job as an on-air anchor in Texas, in Tyler, Texas, when I was like 24 years old. And then uh, spent some time there and then came to Las Vegas. And I've been here for five years and I've been, it's kind of been like a whirlwind. I'm 32, I can't, I've done a lot of things. That's why it looks like it, that's why I need to get Botox tomorrow. Cause I look like I'm, you know, 72. But I'm really 32, you know, but it, it ages you this whole journey. No, man. I still got a long way to go. You look super young and I'm listening to your <laughs> I'm listening to your resume and I'm like, Big Perion, do you hear this this veteran? His resume is long that we got on the show. Yeah, I was just NFL network. I mean, Mike, what else you you've done? I mean, I know I met you, I've known, known you for a little bit, and I'm like. Dude, your resume, Sherman Hensley and all of them and did stand up. That's 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 huge. Listen, I wish I wish I produced some of uh Juvenile's records. <laughs> I I only I only produced one record. It was Shake It Fast by Mystical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm joking. But I but I probably could have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The um I want to we, we we've interviewed um talk show hosts and, and sports anchors before, and everybody seems to have a, a, a uh, I'm going to say a travel history mm -hmm. where yeah. they, they, they go from one place to another and stuff like that. Is that um, common for every, I mean, for the the people that we've interviewed, um, Brian. it seems like it's, it's pretty common. Um, is it just like chasing the, the the best opportunity, or you know, for, or, you know, moving around to find the best opportunity? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's really it's interesting because I think everybody has such a different journey. You know, and I think the older you get, you start to just appreciate. Like when I was younger, it was all about like, what am I gonna accomplish? When am I gonna accomplish it? Like I was so headstrong with everything. And now the older I get, the more I appreciate just the journey, you know, and the fact that I did it, you know, because the, the truth is, yeah, you got to have some innate gifts and some blessings and some luck and, you know, inclinations uh, and, you know, proclivities to certain types of attributes and things are helpful. But the bottom line is you got to do it, you know, and that's the, that's the big thing. So many people are scared or they they don't have the support. I have like the greatest family. My family always supported every any endeavor I wanted to do. So I think like you start appreciating the journey and how long it takes to really get good at something and build up those, you know, like Malcolm Gladwell and Outliers calls it, you know, the 10,000 hours kind of thing. That's what they talk about with the Beatles, you know, like the Beatles, that eight days a week song, they were playing in clubs since they were like 12, 13, 14 years old, you know, so by the time they Beatlemania hit the United States, they had been, you know, jamming out for years in underground clubs. So it doesn't happen overnight, really for most people. So I think the journey is such a big thing and you need that time. Like when I was at Tyler, Texas, I was good and I was good enough to get the job and I learned quickly, but I wasn't as polished as I am now, you know, and I'm sure in 10, 15, 20 years, I'm going to look back and be like, wow, I was so green. Even when I was in Vegas, I can be so much, you know, better. So I think it's about constant improvement and having, you know, a, uh, a beginner's mentality, but also having a little bit of confidence that you can execute and you want to be challenged, but everybody's got such an interesting journey. You know, that's why there's so many great guys like me. One of my heroes is Chris Broussard who came on your guy's show, you know, and he's so good at what he does. And a lot of those guys like him, Stephen A, they worked so many years cultivating perspective as columnists, you know? So, and that's how most of these guys really became amazing journalists and the guys that have the, you know, the the validity to give these types of takes on TV because that's what a column used to be 
back in, you know, the newspaper heyday is like you would go pick up the New York Post, you pick up the Philadelphia Inquirer, you read Stephen A's column and he's talking about, you know, why Larry Brown made a mistake, you know, starting Aaron McKee that night, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, it takes time and years to cultivate those skills. And now look what he's amounted to. So I think every, every job, every stop on the journey gives you something that you need to ultimately get to where you want to be. And I'm sure both of you, if you look back on your careers, it's the same thing, you know? Yes. I'm, I'm still growing and learning, you know, trying to do more and, and learn more. Do you have, um, do you ever do the, um, the mirror stage, you know, where you, you practice in the mirror, how you want to look on the show, or, you know, just, you're, you know, you're, you're getting your, um, working on your personality, your, 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 um, on air personality. Yeah. You know, to me, I'm lucky that stuff comes very natural to me for stand up. It was hard. I have to say like stand up, the hardest thing for me was figuring out who, what my voice is, you know, for just being like a host on talk shows. I have a new show that actually is premiering this weekend called Sin City Beat on uh, Fox 5 Las Vegas and Sin, uh, Silver State Sports and Entertainment Network. But for that show, like, I just know exactly the way I have to be and what my role is and what I bring to the table and how to be entertaining and how to pose questions and how to quarterback a panel of journalists and reporters. Like, that stuff, it just, it just comes to me very easily. Um, Stand-up was hard. Stand-up was something where, like, I didn't, like, early on, I was like, I was just trying to go by who influenced me. So like, I'm going up on stage acting a little bit like Dave Chappelle. I'm acting a little bit like Larry David. I'm acting a little bit like Gary Shandling. Like I'm taking all these people that really influence my humor and trying to figure out a way I can be authentic to myself, but then bring that on the stage. And to be honest, I just never got good enough to to really pursue that full time because I don't think, I think I wanted it too badly and I was too hopeful for a joke. And I think a lot of times when you watch guys like, like Chappelle just came out with one of the greatest stand up sets I've ever seen in my entire life. It just came out on Netflix called like The Dreamer. And I was just blown away by it. And I think what's so amazing about, about him is he really doesn't give a shit if people laugh. You know, and there's a lot of power in that, to be honest, you know, and an audience can sniff very quickly if the comedian on stage is desperate for a laugh, you know, and sometimes it works for comedians. But for me, it, I was so young. And I think when I was younger, I was even better. The older I got, and the, the more successes I had, the more I wanted it badly. And I didn't succeed in in growth and I plateaued so you know th that's why everything is like you kind of have to have a good you have to be very I think humility is such a big thing and humility is great because it allows you to actually honestly evaluate what you you're good at what you're great at what you're not so good at and I'm one of those believe like I believe in you should really put effort into things that you're really great at and forget a little bit about the things that don't come so easy to you, you know, because in today's world, you have to be niche. You have to understand how to package yourself. And this is a marketing podcast, you know, and that's why every good marketing person out there understands that you have to exercise within a niche and understand what you're bringing to the table that other people don't. So I understood that from a very young age. And even when I was at Northwestern and I was getting all these job offers and people were, Hey, come be an anchor here, come do this, come do that. I was like, no, like I want to focus on personality driven stuff. I want to focus on morning television. I want to focus on entertainment. I want to focus on sports. Like I knew I had to get into a place, into a situation where they were going to let me be authentic to me and try to be different but it's hard when you're young to lean into being different you know and that's that's a constant struggle with any artist but I think the more you have that belief in yourself and the more you're willing to double down on what makes you you the sooner you can do that the faster you can get on track to getting to where you want to be wow so they scout well they yeah it's kind of like it's almost like being you know 
an athlete. Like I put together like a, it's called like a reel, you know, that's mm -hmm. what you put like together, like a resume. It's almost like if you were, you know, doing a, a, a basketball mixtape, you know, how all like these high school reel. players now, they have a sizzle reel, they have a mixtape mm -hmm. from all their games in high school and coaches go scout them. And then all of a sudden, you know, that informs their scholarship offers. So I put together like the, it, it's somewhere online. And if somebody saw it, they'd be like, it would be the last thing they would teach you in journalism school. But so we're, here's we're the look long it up. <laughs> You got to check it out. But we're going to look it up. Trust I'll, me. I'll, I'll tell you, it's funny because so like I was pretty, I was okay in school. I wasn't great, you know, like math standardized test that stuff didn't come easy to me you know reading comprehension writing that stuff came easy but like I was bad like my SATs were not good but when I finally went to college and I was studying something I really loved I I got really good grades at University of Miami so when I was able to go to grad school at Northwestern and get to into like the best journalism school in the country and I was taught by J.A. Adonde and all these guys like Mike Wilbon and Mike Greenberg and all these amazing people went there. And I'm like, wow, this is, I felt so excited to be here. But I was amongst all these people who were so smart, so bright, and they were very traditional, you know, most people. And I had this weird sensibility, like people wanted to be covering Trump protests in Chicago when I'm there. And I'm like, hey, it's National Cinnabon Day. Like, let's go learn how to make Cinnabons, you know, like, because I want to eat some icing, mm -hmm. you know, like, so I have to say, like, I was like, uh, I was like the, the, the black sheep, you know, I really was. And people were like, kind, some professors got me and were like, hey, I understand what you're doing. Like, you kind of got this quirky, like late night personality. You should do that. And then some people are like, you're off the wall, dude. Like, you gotta, you gotta just learn how to be a traditional journalist. So I still learned how to do all, you gotta like, it's kind of like, that's why I love jazz, right? And I love Miles. Like, jazz is so great. And tell me if you agree with me, Big, because jazz is like, the only way to become amazing at jazz is you have to learn classical music like you have to learn classical music you have to be trained classically to understand how to play the sax to play piano but Thelonious Monk doesn't just start playing all that crazy music on the piano out of nowhere he learns traditional shit first and then he starts learning how to play the piano like that Charlie Parker Louis Armstrong all these guys Cannonball Adderley they're not starting off with breaking the rules they got to learn the rules then they break the rules so to me Northwestern was kind of like my jazz education I learned the traditional ways and then I was cool enough and confident enough in myself to play some jazz as I got through the program. And the more jazz I played, the more it responded with hiring managers and all these stations. So people started seeing my reel and I took a big chance and I put together a reel. And if most people's reel is classical music, mine was like 10% classical music and 90% jazz. I had the saltine cracker eating challenge on my reel. I had me doing all this crazy stuff in Chicago. And all these people got back to me and they're like, yo, we want you to be like our anchor at our station. I'm like, this is crazy. So I had a bunch of offers, but just like a kid who's getting a D1 offer for football or basketball wants to go to the right situation with the right coach and the right coordinator and the right system for them. I chose this station in Texas that basically said, listen, we want to put you on our morning show. We want you to be personality driven have as much fun on tv as possible and then if you get us up in the rankings in the ratings and we move up from where we are in the market we're going to give you your own talk show at night at 6 30 at night so at 24 years old i got the show up in the ratings and then all of a sudden by 20 24 25 like I had my own talk show on CBS in Texas and I was like man this is like everything I dreamed of when I was a little kid in fourth grade in New Jersey. So it was like, it was pretty crazy, but it's, it's one of those things when you look back and now being 32, it's like, man, like who was that guy? Like, how did I have the confidence in myself to trust my own instincts, you know? And I don't even have the answer, but you just have to have like faith. And I think 
having a, a good family that gives you that confidence in yourself to, to know that you have something valuable to bring and valuable perspective. It's, it's weird, you know, but I think most artists are very confident, but at the same time, very insecure, you know? Yeah. So I wouldn't say that I'm not like, I was very insecure. I still am, but there's parts of me that are very confident too. Mike, I want to touch on a, on a couple of things real quick. Cause um, I want to get into it's all-star weekend. And we'll circle back yeah. to, to your career, but I want to get a couple of things in before because time goes by really quick. Um, it's All-Star Weekend. Tell us your thoughts on All-Star Weekend. They're implementing something new. They're going to have Steph Curry going against uh, Sabrina from the New York uh, Liberty. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Give us your thoughts on you know the whole overall weekend so far and the celebrity game that just happened tonight. Gotcha. So, you know, NBA All-Star Weekend is like my favorite thing in the world growing up. My dad took me to the All-Star game in Philly when MJ was playing for the Wizards. AI, it was a big, you know, game. Kobe, it was just so much fun. Dunk contest, Jason Richardson won. I, I remember all the elements. Mm -hmm. um, I don't love a lot of the new things that the NBA has implemented to get away from the traditional stuff. I thought the traditional stuff was great. I do think there's little things that are fun. I think the Sabrina Unescu facing Steph Curry is going to be a lot of fun. Tonight was an interesting thing because one of the shows I do on Fox 5 and Silver State uh, Sports and Entertainment Network is a partnership we have with the G League Ignite, the basketball team here in Henderson that has all these young and up and coming prospects. Scoot Henderson was on the team last year. Dyson Daniels. Um, Shaq's son was on there for a minute too, right? Who? Shaq's son. Yeah. Yeah. Sharif yeah. Yeah, was he, on the team. Yeah. Um, they've had a lot of guys, Jalen Green. So this year they got a guy named ron holland ethan almanza modest buzelis and tyler smith and they all played tonight in the rising stars game against mm -hmm. um they played for team debt left shrimp they actually won one game modest buzelis hit a fadeaway jumper to take them into the championship game they lost to jalen rose's team and uh benedict uh, Mather and uh, one MVP, but it's cool to see some synergy there with Las Vegas and Henderson and the G League kind of bringing some of these high touted prospects who are going to be highly drafted next year into the All Star game. So I like to see that a lot. I like the UNESCO with um, Steph Curry thing. My guy, my childhood friend, Jalen Brunson, point guard for the Knicks, he's going to be in the three point shooting contest tomorrow as well. So I'm excited to see that. He yes, should have been a starter in the All-Star game, but he's a reserve. Um, so I'm excited to see him. I think it's one of the greatest events. You know, I liked watching the celebrity thing tonight. C.J. Stroud and uh, uh, Michael Parsons look good in the game. Michael, the game. Michael Parsons had 37 points and he plays football. I know. I mean, and he's guys, dunked and he's only 6'3". I know. These guys are so talented. Puka Nakua look good. So to me, it's... Uh, I love the NBA All-Star game. I It's a shame because I do think social media has ruined a lot of things like this. You know, I remember sitting up all night, watch, turning on TNT to watch these things because there was no other way to watch the dunk contest. You weren't going to see, you know, Zach Levine or Dwight Howard or any of these Nate Robinson moments. Like, the only way to watch it, Vince Carter was like, you got to turn on the TV to see it. Now, it's like you just put on Twitter in two seconds and like, okay, boom, you, you got the whole, every dunk is right there on your phone. And it takes away a little bit of like, I think the community feeling of everybody watching in that moment, you know? And I think there's pretty much only like the Super Bowls like that now, you know, or a champion, like the NBA finals. Like it's, it's just hard to get people collectively feeling like they're watching the same thing at the same time. So I think, you know, I'm still the NBA All-Star game. That's my favorite thing. I'll always love it. Um, but it just sucks that I think so many of those moments are stripped from us because it's just funneled through social media. But it's just kind of the, like, the new way things are. I mean, Big Perry, I mean, like, how about just streaming, right? I mean, look at all these album covers behind you. I mean, I love streaming because I can listen to everything right on my phone. But it's like it's changed the game so much because it's not even like about – you know, people used to put together an album 
Mm -hmm. it was like, we're going to make an album like a story, you know, like it's a beginning, middle, and then we're going to put together like this record. It's going to be like with album notes and all these kinds of cool things. And I would, I still love like, took, you know, taking out like a John Coltrane album, seeing like, oh, you know, like Philly Jones, like, you know, played on this or, you know, or Art Tatum was on piano on the, you know, it's like, I like those things. And it's like, now it's like streaming. You don't even know what's going on. It's just like electronic music or something. Like yeah. people pressing buttons. Like this is where I feel old. But what do you think about you're forced that? To, you're forced to listen to a certain type of um, artist over and over again. They don't give you like the, the variety like they used to. When you mentioned the Beatles, I looked at, I got a cover over here, the Beatles 65. And it's, you get the personality of the 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 artists in their artwork. It it you don't really get that now. Everything is like real quick and fast. They push the music so hard in your face before they actually give you the personality of the artist. And then a lot of times when the artist starts speaking in interviews, people look at them crazy. Like that's what we've been listening to. That's what we've been following. You know. So it it it's it's too. To me, it seems like in every industry they're trying too hard. You know, they're 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 trying they're trying too hard to make money as fast as they can, and then they move on to the next thing instead of taking the time to build something and make it solid. And yeah. make it, it's it's because artists never get a chance to show everything that they can do and what they're about because they they have to do what's working right now, mainstream instead right. of to actually make, to showing their heart. It's crazy. And like, I'm looking, you got a Cool in the Gang album there. Like I've interviewed Robert Cool Bell many times. And like, I mean, you go to those concerts and I'm like, damn, I mean, how many songs did these brothers write together? I mean, it's sick. The talent level, it's, it's kind of like, you know, watching Vince Carter dunk. You know, it's like, man, how can you be so talented? You can write, get down on it. You can write, you know, fresh. You can write, you know, too hot. You can write, you know all these songs they can put together and it's like man like how talented can a group of people be see i mean look i mean the beatles when you talk about writing hits it's ridiculous the amount of songs they i mean they put together you know just it's just nuts so i i mean i get i get worked up with a lot of this kind of stuff too but i don't like to take the the angle of like oh i'm an old guy and there's no good music because that that's not how it is there are so many great artists now that have that 70s 80s like guys like gary clark jr duran jones and the indications there's so many good groups and stuff out there it's just like it's just it's everything is like a niche now you know like there's nobody knows every anything anymore it's like the one per like i i can barely name like songs from taylor swift you know and she's the biggest right. artist in the Mike, world i got i want to get a, get a couple more questions in because we're running out of time um real, real quick i wanted to ask you we had uh the super bowl here i know you didn't get yeah. to, get to cover it tell us a bit, little bit about your experience with the super bowl and then I'll also before you go i want i know you mentioned your new show that was coming up i want you to plug that real quick too Okay, great. Yeah, I'm very long-winded. This is why I'm a talk show host. <laughs> no, no um, problem. I like to talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I was hospitalized with uh, a, a pretty severe problem uh, during the week of the Super Bowl. But leading up to it, I was able to cover some things. I spoke to B. John Robinson, the rookie running back with the Atlanta Falcons, who's, uh, you know, a tremendous dude off the field and, of course, amazing on the field. Um, you know, it, I think Las Vegas, it's, here's the story of the Super Bowl in Vegas. It's ridiculous as we're talking, it kind of is, it's a parallel conversation to everything we're talking about in, in terms of the way our world has changed. When I was growing up, I mean, David Stern was like adamant that an NBA team would never come to Las Vegas. You know, the fact that they even had the All-Star game here that year was like a crazy thing, right? Mm -hmm. There was all those stories of Rodman and Jordan partying and like all these crazy things. And it's like professional sports are never going to be in Las Vegas. Well, the fact that we had a Super Bowl here, the fact that there's 
the WNBA here, an NFL franchise here, the, the Oakland A's potentially coming here, an NBA franchise probably owned by LeBron James coming here in the future. It's it's a testament to how much sports has changed in the way that we indulge in our sports, um, you know, action. I mean, everything now is about sports gambling, you know, and the way that fans can get a piece of the action by having investment in the game rather than just being a fan of the team. It's about having a monetary investment and incentive. So it's pretty crazy. And the fact that it, the Super Bowl went down here is such a special thing. Uh, everything I've heard, I have a new show that actually premieres tonight in a half hour on Silver State Sports and Entertainment Network. And um, it's called Sin City Beat. We broke down the entire game and the fact that Vegas was a host city for the Super Bowl. And I think it's a testament to, you know, not only the entertainment capital of the world, but now a city that's becoming potentially the sports capital of the world. And I think we're going to see more and more um, an NBA franchise come here and all these great things. And I think, you know, the Super Bowl was really well done from everybody I spoke to, all the things that I attended. It really was a, a, a well put together event. I think F1 was a little rockier. And I think locals didn't love F1 in Las Vegas as much as the Super Bowl. But the Super Bowl knows how to throw an event. It's a very well oiled machine. And um, I'm gar- I guarantee you there will be more Super Bowls here. And I can't wait for an NBA team to be here. Real quick, tell us what we can look forward to on your new show and when when, when it will air. So basically, you know, I've been here in Vegas for four and a half years, almost five years. Um, I came here. I was known really as being this personality guy who was on the morning show. And I would, you know, go around town and eat food and talk to celebrities and interview all these great guys. I've, you know, had such a great time. But I've always wanted to get back into sports and the way that our city is, you know, shifting into this sports Mecca. I really wanted to take advantage of that opportunity. So um, I was presented this great uh, opportunity to become the first ever uh, host uh, an employee of a new brand new sports network here that's owned by Fox five. It's called the silver state sports and entertainment network. Currently I have like, let's see, I have, I host a show called the fantasy goat, which goes on during the fantasy football season. I host a show called G league, uh, NBA G league ignite takeover, which is all about the NBA G league team here in Henderson. I do a, a show called SOS sound off sports where it's kind of like a traditional kind of sports talk show where people can actually send us emails they can phone in questions and we talk about stuff we've had steven jackson on pro football hall of famer uh mike haynes we've had ufc ring girl on the show Brittany palmer um we've had a lot of earl campbell pro football hall of fame running back we've had on the show so it was great great show and then i also do a show called the vegas huddle brandon you know that well cj's been on that show cj watson have had uh, Raleigh Fingers, Spencer Haywood, so many great guys on that show. It's kind of like a podcast show. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Sin City Beat now. So <laughs> I got a lot of shows going on on this network. Really so you can, watch ev- you can watch everything on YouTube. You can, uh, from wherever, it's uh, on uh, throughout the country here in Vegas. It's on Cox Channel 125 or 5.2 over the air. And it also plays on Fox 5 Las Vegas as well. Great. Mike, we got a few minutes left. A couple other things. Where can people follow you and find you on social media? I'm uh, at Michael Mike Davis on Instagram because I couldn't get Mike Davis. I couldn't get Michael Davis. So I just put them all together. I did Michael Mike Davis. And I'm going to tell you the two questions I always get when I'm walking around town in Vegas. One, Man, it, well, it's not really a question. They're like, you look so much better with short hair because I used to have long hair. I used to kind of look like Lionel Richie without the sweater. You know, <laughs> I kind of like walked around town with, you know, it was, it was, they, my nickname was, you know, hard like Sunday morning. It, it was, <laughs> nothing was easy about this look. Um, but that's the one question I get. And the other question I get is, um, is your middle name Mike from social media? People actually think my name, people think my parents, Stephen and Lynn Davis named me Michael Mike Davis. They're like, they actually think that's my name. And I'm like, no, I, I, it's a very common name. I went to high school 
And there was another kid in my high school who was a troublemaker. Like I was a troublemaker, but I was too smart to get detention. You know, I got detention a few times, but I was, you know, I wasn't going to get detention. There was a kid in my high school named Michael Davis, who was a year younger than me. And he would get detention all the time. And they would, the, the, whoever handled sending out detention notices to parents, I would actually get these notices and my parents would be like, what did you do this time? I'm like, I didn't do it. It was another kid named Mike Davis. I swear to God. So that's how common this name is. But long story short, Instagram, Michael, Mike Davis, Twitter, X at Mike Davis TV and uh, Facebook, Michael Davis, Mike. It's hard to get them all. I got to, you know, I got to come up with a name like Thelonious. What's what should be my new name? I just keep it as Mike, funny man, Mike. There we go. <laughs> funny man, Mike. I like that one. Mike, 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 Mike. Hey, you know what? Who told me that? Somebody told me so I was on somebody else's yeah, podcast and they minute, said, gentlemen. they said I'm a Mike, Mike. I don't even know what that means, but somebody <laughs> once told me that. All right, Mike. Well, we appreciate you being on the show. We definitely want to have you back. I saw you interview Mark Wahlberg. How was that? Oh, yo, Mark Wahlberg is the man. He's such a nice guy. For the for the level of fame that he has, he is one of the gen, most genuine, sweetest guys I've ever interviewed. Same with Shaq. I love Shaq, too. He's a re- Shaq's a really good dude, like, like high-quality human being. All right. Well, thanks, gentlemen, for being on the show. Sorry to cut it short. We're running out of time. Mike, we definitely going to have you back, talk more. This time, we're going to talk some comedy, not just sports. Thank you.